All right, good evening, everyone. It is Sunday night, and you're here with uh, Cypher Live. So you've got me, uh, James. I'm here, as always, with Mark. Good evening, folks. And Ryan Chaddock. Hello. You know, I say as always. I think every YouTuber or podcast, like, I'm joined, as always, by. And then, then they don't show up one day, and it's like, where, where did they go? <laughs> as and always, but this one time. It's a scandal at that point. It's like, indefinitely. Kicked off the it's show. indefinite. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to start saying I'm joined indefinitely by yeah. Mark and Ryan. We'll start as, as, as usual, maybe? Yes, as usual sounds fantastic. All right, so tonight's show is sort of what last month's show was supposed to be, which is discussing all of the rules that you can find inside the Cypher system rulebook. Sorry, I have pages coming out. These are notes. Mark's a player in my game, so he can't read these. So, Mark, <laughs> close your eyes. So, yeah. No, I'm going to cheat. Uh, so we'll get to that in one second. Just since it's uh, March 30th right now, I'm going to put this out there, just the announcement that right now, live, uh, yeah, live, live now on March 20th, there is a Kickstarter for Worlds of the Cypher system that's still on. Uh, so if you Google that, you can jump over there and see. I think they broke 170000 at this uh, we're at like 167, I think, when I checked earlier. So maybe by the end of the show here, it'll break 170. <laughs> Who knows? I'll be, yeah, be awesome. So, uh, yeah, go check that out, and that's going to have uh, setting materials for dinosaurs, gods, and superheroes. It's in much more detail. I give it not enough play in that sentence there. But if you want to know more about that, just go to the last episode of Cypher Live, and you can go watch that. We skipped this section to discuss... Worlds of the Cypher system, but now we're back. And uh, so tonight we'll be discussing all the rules that are kind of located in this book that are more rulesy. Because I, I think when we were splitting up how we were going to discuss this tonight, I'm happy taking kind of a back seat to Mark and Ryan on this because when I got my Cypher system rule book, I don't know about the two of you, obviously not the same as two of you, I just was like, oh, new foci and descriptors. And ciphers. I'm good, you know, and I <laughs> moved on. <laughs> well, you know, if you read the introductory like page, it actually mentions some of the new things, and to me that got me hooked. Like, not that I wouldn't have bought it, but it was like kind of a cool thing that there would be new stuff. It isn't just a rehashing of what's in the Strange, which is fairly universally adapted from Numenera. Uh, it's it really has its own thing. I mean, this is a long book. It's over 400 pages, so it has to be introducing new things, right? One would hope. I mean, if it was 400 pages of just copy <laughs> paste, that would just be well, yeah, that would be well, bad. <laughs> it's certainly needy, and, and that's just sort of my. I think when I got it, I was in the middle of a strange campaign, and it was like I don't really have time for all this. But again, new stuff to throw in. Lots so, of new books, I. Right. Yeah, new foci, some new descriptors. Uh, you know the the type abilities. There's some new type uh, new type abilities that were not copied from uh, elsewhere. Um, well, we're gonna jump into all that here. Uh, but first, before we do that, just to point to us out there, we have a window open. I don't know if I'm pointing it to you on your screen, but it's up here for us, and it's the Q and A box. So you can type in questions in Q and A. Uh, I know uh, Andy Lyons already said he's going to post some, some, some comments on there. Uh, so toss in some questions you want us to answer on here, or you want to make Mark and Ryan, who've actually read the book cover to cover, answer. Uh, and I will delightfully just send them their way as we go along. So uh, you can also uh, ask questions at my Twitter handle, which is right there, which is... Uh, I live for crits, and also you can go on to the, I think the Google event page or Facebook or wherever you're reading this, and I have my, my iPad here ready to answer your questions. So, But this is the easiest. We'll see the questions through the Q&A app. So let's, let's start with Ryan and discuss flavors. And the only section I really read first, but it's still like, eh, I'm not sure I get it 100%. Ryan, how do flavors work and what is a flavor? So the main thing to know about flavors so, uh, is that, well, flavors are a way of making new types. So in a sense, it's like kind of class creation. 
it's from the perspective really of the GM. Like when you're setting up your game, you're going to be saying, well, you know, in this uh, you know cyberpunk game, we're going to have uh, you know we're going to need somebody who can hack. Um, so we're going to take adept and mix it with the tech flavor. And so all of a sudden it's sort of hacking and making effects in the real world um, or effects in cyberspace, and that's what their adept powers are. Um, it's weird because what you essentially have to do is swap out powers. Um, so basically each of the flavors has six tiers, just like a normal power set. Uh, it's almost like a little mini type. And you're supposed to basically pick and choose which powers different um, abilities from the flavor are replacing. So you might say, well, the warrior in in this setting isn't going to be as much about melee attacks. They're more about ranged attacks because this is Wild West or something. So we'll swap those out for these other more Wild West related ones in the flavor I'm picking here. Yeah, it becomes... so. The problem with it is it's a little tedious and it feels a little arbitrary when you're doing it. Um, yeah, I don't get I the that, swap out. Like, why? Why not? I mean, obviously, if you're not taking something else, you're sort of swap swapping it out. Right. But the idea is to limit player options. You don't oh, okay. Just have a ton of options every tier. It's just a, oh well. In this particular case, this is what's going on here. Um, I, I think it works, and in play balance terms, it's perfect. The problem is, as a GM, it's a lot of work. Like, you'll notice that, for instance, in each of the genres, um, they suggest ways that you can build new types, essentially, by uh, blending the existing four types, because this game actually has four types, not three like the other games, um, which is really important. The speaker gets added, sort of, or, or I don't know what you want to say is the added one, but... Um, yes. <laughs> it's really good. It's great having all four of those, and it's great being able to mix and max... Cause it, Really, you can build all kinds of things using the ones in here. Because some of these type, uh, some of these flavors are just like combat or magic. So really, you can turn anything in, into anything else by kind of blending things. And what I found also when constructing my Star Wars stuff was that I could build flavors out of foci, because foci are also a list of powers categorized from one to six tiers. So you can be like, uh, what I ended up doing for um, the pilot one was to, to build a type out of the uh, focus for piloting starfighters, essentially, and just say, that's a flavor, so I'm going to blend that with warrior and build an entire sort of ace pilot uh, class. Yeah, it's, um, it's, really, it's really something you would do for a campaign. Not, you certainly wouldn't do the effort for a one-shot. That's, that's mm -hmm. way more... Way more trouble than it's worth for a one shot. No. But if you were if you were planning on running a long campaign, uh, and you spe had specific ideas on, you know, all all characters in this setting use magic, for instance, then you might say, all right, I need to, I'm going to take the magic flavor, I'm going to add it to the speaker, the explorer, and the warrior, and the adept. You, you pretty much already is magic, so you're good there, and and you would swap out abilities from that sort of list. And say, okay, this is what the new warrior looks like. This is what the new explorer looks like. And then your characters, your, your players have have those two new choices. And it's important to notice I, that there's a combat flavor, so you can basically turn anything into a hybrid with warrior simply yeah. by adding the combat flavor. Um, yeah, you can do so, a, a war, an adept who's good at combat. Yeah. So really, it's Better. like a toolbox for building your own types, is what yeah. it is. And I imagine if you wanted to start from complete scratch, you could probably take just flavors and kind of yes. stitch together a raw type. I mean, you would yeah. have to do a little Definitely. bit of you'd have to do a little bit of calculation in terms of like what your starting efforts are going to be and, and that yeah. kind of a thing. But and you could even pull a few powers from whatever types you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just it would be a ton of it would be a fair amount of work. I mean, it's kind of just building a table, but it's kind of it's a little bit. It's a lot of lookup for the player later on. Yeah, basically. I so, mean, it's it's a toolbox. So. Yeah. So I mean, a question I'll be asking tonight fairly frequently here is how does it how is it applicable or is it applicable to either Numenera, The Strange, or other Cipher system games out there or homebrewed campaigns? You know, I, I think the modifies types. I think it'd be a challenge for it to, to see it in The Strange. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it really works for Numenera, I would say, where you could say, well, um, 
you know, if magic in Numenera is the nanotech, right? And so nanos and to some degree jacks have access to that. What if we wanted to just make it so everybody has a little bit of access to it? Well, we could just use the magic flavor mm. and say, well, in this particular region, there's a higher density of nanites, and everybody has a little bit of magic, <coughs> or the nanites work to this one particular way. Um, you know, there's there's a stealth flavor in there, so if you just want to make everything a little bit more about espionage, you can just say, oh, well, you can also take powers from the stealth flavor. And just give people the option, that just pushes them a little bit in that direction. You could go the same way with a war game. If you're going to be telling the story of a war, just give the combat flavor as available for all types. Why not? Um, you are giving things up to get to take those. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, it, it's not the way that, that they wrote it, and, 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 you know, maybe they were intending it to have some sort of, you know, finite limits on, on player choice, but, I mean, you could just as easily say, you know what, you can take choices from that flavor as well, and you don't necessarily lose anything from your core type because you can still only choose a certain number of, of abilities. Yeah, and and just you just leave the whole thing wide open. In a lot of ways, it's an embellishment of the, because you know in the GM sections they'll be like, uh, here's ways that you can modify a, fla uh, a focus. It's really an embellishment of that in a lot of ways, where it's just like, well, here's some just raw building blocks of powers mm -hmm. for each tier. You know, subdivided by tier, and some of them really work together. Like in the tech tree, there's ones that have to do with drones. You know, that you could use. You know, works absolutely perfectly with the way Shadowrun is going these days. Um, you know, so I I think the whole thing is just like a big toolbox for constructing whatever you want. Gotcha. All right. Well, let's let's move on from there then, and move into. And this will be a short one here because. Uh, as I've read more of it, it's I, I discussed in the uh, the intro to the show here price categories. And when I first saw them, I was like, oh, price categories. Because I remember D20 Modern was the first time I saw like purchase DCs, and I hated that. And it, it really ruined D20 Modern having that, not thinking that I could buy like, a hoagie like just with like five bucks. You know, a five dollar foot long was like a DC four price foot long and that doesn't work well for me. So I kinda wanna know that my foot long on subway <laughs> is gonna be in dollars. You know they're not five dollars anymore, right? They're raising the prices on those. I don't need a subway anymore, so I don't know. I, mean, I don't know what they're <laughs> they're not when I went to Subway anymore. last it was it was a five dollar foot long and there was a song with it. I know. They've and they've upped it to like six or seven. I can't I forget what it is. But it was never like D C DC five foot long. I never said that, you know. They should make you make a roll before you purchase it. Yeah, they did. Uh, so, but that's not how this works. I can't. No, it's not. It's not. And I, I, I agree. I, but when I first saw it, up to even before we did the show, I feel like you're like tricking week. me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I went and read it, and I'm like, oh, it doesn't quite. It's even more arbitrary than that. You know, it's like, okay, you have five price categories. Inexpensive, moderately priced, expensive, very expensive, and exorbitant. And it doesn't quite tell you uh, what it means. If you're going to buy an exorbitant item, what do you do to do that? You know, uh, it's not quite clear. But at the same time, it's better than Numenera on wealth. You know what I'm saying? Like, when you used to buy the long-term benefit for wealth, it was like, inexpensive items are free. And it's like, well, we don't know what the inexpensive items are. Yeah, yeah or it was like, you get 500 chins. I'm like, well, okay. Um, I, I think the thing with, with the price categories here is, you know, the intent is that you raid the Dragon's Horde in your fantasy cipher game, and you cart all the gold and stuff back to town. You sell off everything that you didn't want to keep, and the GM says, all right, you guys now have enough money to buy up to four exorbitant items or up to, you know, X number of, you know, expensive items or very expensive items. And, and you, the GM basically just breaks it down in terms of price categories. That's sacrilege. And instead of saying, here's a bajillion coins, I hope you have an accounting degree. I don't know. That's, that's, that's so hard for me to, to, to... It's a bitter pill for me to swallow. Some people I love the, 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 the coin counting. Others... I hate coin counting. I despise, like... Money in games. It just makes me annoyed. I, mean, I don't want to be. I don't want to be having to worry about buying 
like um, every piece of magic item like it's a, like it's a 3.0 or 4.0. I don't want that. I'm not I'm not advocating that. Mm. But I think that I, I was fine with shins. I had no problem with shins. I had more of an issue when you had to break up shins into like shinlets and stuff, or bits or whatever you or, or, or <laughs> you essentially just do the dark sun bits yeah. or shamwows or whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean yeah, break it into something here. Uh, I think I remember oh, because Lex Starwalker was talking about that or not. It was just how to carve them up into something, and I don't know. I I, I that was, so I don't want to focus too much on it, but that's my my initial comment was price categories was a rule. It's not a rule. It's more like a guideline. So yeah. sorry. Well, it's, not, it's not hard and fast. And I, I mean, as as a GM, I I would probably use it in a certain way, and I would actually deviate from what they wrote anyway. But by like, I would also allow players to purchase training in wealth that would essentially allow. Rest, represent like you know investments that would then allow them to buy more expensive things more easily and like yada, yada yada yada. But that's because I don't mind price categories. <laughs> so so a, a subway foot long of an inexpensive item that oh, was an inexpensive item and now it's a moderately priced item. Because <laughs> it went up. It went I think up it's still price. inexpensive. I think the 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 according to the book the the categories are are uh, log they're they're a log base. So each one is ten times more than the previous one. That's true. Yeah. So unless that's a sixty, a fifty dollar foot long, which would be way too expensive <laughs> for Subway, then it's still an inexpensive item. It's that, not worth fifty dollars. You know, actually, the fact that they do it log, it really reminds me of. Do you guys ever play the DC Heroes role playing game? No. Um, they have a, a everything is on a scale that doubles each. You know, it it's it's order of power. Uh, so basically, it you know, each, level one or level two is twice what level one is, right? Yeah. So level three is twice that. So they use the same. They use a wealth system like the one you're talking about, where you have to essentially make a roll in order to hit certain things. Um, so this fits perfectly with that in a, in a sense. If you were thinking of it, if you're going to do it as, say, each of these tiers is a level of an intellect test you need to make in order to afford something. Um, I think this is intended to just make everything fast and easy. Um, that's and that's it, pretty clear. I like, think as someone who. I don't know. I think because I have an econ degree, like I think I just really enjoy novel ways of handling money. Like I, I like seeing new ways. <laughs> this is an interesting way to do it. Um, I just wish there was more guidance because of all the subcategories. Because if they just had inexpensive and everything else, that would be easier because of the way wealth works and the way the wealthy uh, descriptor works. But I'm not seeing anything else interfacing with the higher level ones, and so I just wish there was. You know, if there is going to be a test, let's know how that intellect test works or whatever. Um, See, I want to take this and transfer this back to real life because I like do the financials for my 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 branch office. I want to say to my boss, "Well, we missed our budget this month by a moderate amount, and <laughs> uh, and that's that's fine." You know, what's that mean? I don't know. It's moderate. We moderately missed it. You know. Oh, it, well, it's like in accounting. In accounting, there's a term for when some an amount is so small, it's not legally important to account for it. And that's immaterial. My company's never heard of that number. Everything's legally important. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah. No, I understand. Yeah, if it's over a certain amount, you know, for us, but when it, all those little amounts add up. That's why I tell my guys when they're well, reporting to me their finances. That's why it's, people like to, you know, really keep track of their silvers and coppers. Yeah. Some people are like that. Yeah, I, that's I, us. Uh, all right, me. let's get into some more of that meat and potatoes rules here. So there's. there's there's uh, there really are uh, several rules here, like insight, power shifts, horror mode. Those are the big ones we're going to discuss. And again, I'm going to bring up the Q and A box is open. You can send us questions, and we will answer them. Or Mark and Ryan will answer them, and I will sit back and ask them. <laughs> I don't know the rules. All right. So Jim is coasting this episode. I am coasting. I am here as uh, I am like the I don't know. I'm just here you're to the, talk. You're the proxy <laughs> audience. I'm the what's the guy that does Jeopardy? I'm the Alex Trebek. Oh God! The episode. It's a pretty face for us. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, Mark, let's discuss insight. Now, insight's on page two fifteen, two sixteen. Two sixteen. And insight is so insight's a way for your players to either gain concrete facts for, like, progress towards solving a mystery 
or gain concrete facts with regards to planning out actions that they have in mind. And the system is pretty simple. It's you spend some time doing research, gathering, talking to people, you know, uh, whatever is, is required for that particular insight that they're looking for. And then you spend three intellect points as an action. And then the GM gives an, a piece of information. So I'll actually read it here. And it's they gain a single bit of special knowledge from the GM that she can count on with certainty. They are always presented as absolutes, and once established, they should never be changed unless it is through the direct and deliberate intervention of the PCs. So a, a good example to, to – uh, if, if we're going to play uh, a Shadowrun-esque cipher game and the characters are trying to break into some compound, um, they could go there the night before they want to break in study the route that the guards take when they walk around the perimeter, study when the you know shift changes are, and then they could m spend three intellect points and uh, take an action to gain an insight that would give them something with regards to that, those, you know, the guards and how they would get into that compound. So the GM <laughs> might say that at from 10 to 10, 10, 15, there's an open window on this side of the building because the, you know, when the shift changes over, the you know both sets of guards have to be in the guardhouse to sign in and sign out, and so there's there's an opening there that allows them there. And so long as the the player characters don't do something that would cause that to change, that is an absolute truth. They go there the next day to actually infiltrate this place, and from ten to ten fifteen, they've got a window. That's what insights are. Now there is a, a weird rule though. The GM instigated one. The GM instigated ones are, are, are basically GM says, you know, uh, it, and I think these kind of really apply more to uh, mystery type of situations, but the GM might say, you know, after the characters have gone through an area, they might say, hey, there's an insight to be gained here. And then the, instead of spending intellect points, it's to experience as though you were buying a short-term mm -hmm. benefit. Now, I, I don't know if I care for that because it the section, it, it's only an additional paragraph, and it doesn't really call out why this version costs experience when the other costs intellect. And it seems to me that the information you'd be giving is essentially the same. So I'm not entirely certain what's going on there. Also, I've never been clear as to whether uh, edge, intellect edge applies here. So uh, I, I'd, I'd have, I'm not either, but I'm going to go ahead and say it probably shouldn't. Because otherwise you're going to have that guy who's got three intellect edge and he's just going to ask for an insight on every action that he does. Yeah. And he's going to and he's going to peg the GM into a corner with absolutes. So it's the only reason why I say that is because this is something where the cost should be definite. But I think what, what I like about this is it gives the it gives a little bit of narrative control up. You know, from the GM standpoint, you are now saying, you're now telling the players, this is absolutely true. But on the other hand, it puts that narrative control into the players' hands and it allows them the confidence to execute a plan or the confidence to know that, you know, Bob the accountant is not the killer or... Mm -hmm. The killer is definitely a guy who has uh, who is left-handed, and then they can they can use that to try to f solve that mystery. Or, you know, if it's a if it's something like the the shift change of the guards thing, they can use that when they execute their plan. And that's something that it, sometimes in games is difficult for the player and the GM to kind of make that linkage, um, because the GMs will feel like they have to have. You know, if you have guards wandering around on the outside of a building, well, it, the players need to make a roll to get past them or, or whatnot. And it's like, well, if I spent the previous day watching the guards, shouldn't I have found an opening? Well, this allows them to find that opening. This allows them to understand that the, the safe they're trying to crack into has, you know, 256-bit uh, 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 encryption and that their hacker is going to have to have a certain piece of gear to be able to break that safe. Andy was Andy uh, at End Lion just another thing over saying insight equals reverse GM intrusion. And Andy, you're asking a question. I think I think it makes sense as a statement. It kind of does. It, it's a little bit, except that if it was a truly a reverse GM intrusion, the players would say, 
I'm paying three intellect points, and this is this. See, I like that better. I but, actually, the, but it's the GM that's that's providing the information. Yeah, it's, I got that. Right. You know, and yeah. I think that's important because then the because the, the the players. Let's face it. When you're on the GM side of the table, players can be dicks. <laughs> they can because they want to break your plans into little tiny pieces. It, it happens. And but isn't that it's not different than Edge of the Empire and the weird dice in Edge of the Empire though? It, it's not, except for the players don't have control over the weird dice. The dice have control over that. But the players need to describe what happened. They, well, I mean, depending on how you play it, I mean, yeah. I we've treaded into the sort of narrative end of the pool now. Yeah, so we definitely It depends have. on how narrative your game is. If you yeah. run a table that's closer to fiasco and you're just sort of collective storytelling, nobody's going to have a problem with the player describing things. I often have players describe their intrusions. Yeah. Um, I think it just I mean, depends on how you run your table. Yeah, and I do the same thing on... If, if a player rolls a 1 or if a player rolls a, uh, a 19 or a 20... I'll 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 ask the player if they have an idea of what they want for their either GM intrusion or major or minor effect, and so in the case of this, if I was GMing and somebody wanted insight, I would I would ask well, you know, I'd ask them to kind of narrow it down what they're looking for, you know, are they looking for under you know understanding that there is a shift change that they can exploit to to break into this place, or there is a, you know, an absolute piece of information regarding this this killer of. Uh, you know, if they're searching for Jack the Ripper, like an absolute piece of information about Jack the Ripper that they can use to help solve that crime. And if they've got an idea that, you know, I can either say, yeah, that, that idea is good, it's appropriate, or I can say, well, that's a little bit too much, but I'll give you this much. And, you know, dial it down to where you need to be. Or maybe if they give you a suggestion that's a little weak, you can dial it up to where it needs to be. Um, you know, and that's that's just my personal style. I... I like to pull my my players because I feel that a lot of times they come up with stuff that I would not have thought of until like 45 minutes later and then I've been like, damn it. So uh, we got a question here on this topic here. This is from Mark Cleveland, Massengal. He says, I feel this undermines play in some ways and make th makes things more abstract. If we spend time, points doing a thing, shouldn't we just get the result? Well, and that's what insights does. That's exactly what insights are. If you spend eight hours the previous day uh, uh, studying the layout of a compound and then spend the intellect points, the GM says, here is the safe path into this uh, building. Or, you know, this is the location of the secret room you have to find or what have you. It, it is essentially, it's, it's rewarding it in a non- in-game mechanic. It's it's giving the information to the players, not necessarily giving it to the player characters. I'm having a hard time understanding if, if the player characters, if my player characters said to me, we are going to spend eight hours mm -hmm. observing what happens here. We're going to watch the guards, and they're going to say that. Um, you know, what, what, what do I see? And, uh, you know, why wouldn't they just be told? Why do they have to spend something to get, to get that? Unless it's just the idea that I, they're not saying the guards. They're saying, I'm just watching. And well, the way so the, the way that I look at it is it's twofold. So one, if they just want to, if they don't want to spend any resources, I might say, well, all right, I need you to make a, a, a task check. I need you to make an intellect roll you know, for surveillance to see whether or not you actually spot that opening. Instead, the insight mechanic is, I'm spending these points, I found the opening, tell me what the opening is. Okay. Right, because I'm smart enough to do it. I like to think of it as very similar to, because there are rules and there's sort of guidelines in these games for carrying things. Like, if you just want to spend might, you can just be like, well, I carry this heavy thing for an hour, I'm going to spend some might points. It's essentially taking damage. Yeah. It's the same way with this. This is just mental weight. Yep. You know, you're just doing slogging through something difficult or expressing the fact that your character is this smart. Yeah. Um, and in, in, in the intent, I mean, they, the, the stated intent in the in the book is that it is <clears throat> it's there to bridge the gap between character expertise and player expertise. Right. It's because, especially good for capers. Yeah. If I'm a master, if I'm a master thief, then. My character, or my character is a master thief. Then he's going to know how to break into the place the the best way possible to not get caught. 
I'm a law-abiding citizen. I've never broken into anything except my own home because I got myself locked out. I have no idea how to break into a place. I spend the intellect points. I get the insight because the insight bridges that gap of knowledge between myself and my character. Also, can I mention, I'm, I'm testing something weird with this. Um, I've been developing a system for a, a, a basically like a vampire setting um, and testing out having insights representing instinct. Um, so, and the idea is that vampires are more powerful than humans, so the intellect portion of it is sort of, you know, instead of just having insight because of extreme knowledge, it's insight in terms of uh, superhuman senses, right? Almost bestial superhuman senses where you sense things. But I'm also playing with the idea of spending speed and might in a similar way to just accomplish feats. So you might spend some speed as sort of a speed insight to, or instinct to just get across the battlefield quickly without anyone seeing you because you're sort of, you know, you're like Brad Pitt and you're, you're quick or whatever. Yeah, so you spend three <laughs> speed points and you use your celerity to just... Exactly. Pff, so and I'm then, and then the that. GM is, is obligated to not make you roll to trip on a, a trip wire or a triggered landmine or anything like that. You just you just move on with it. You say, all right, I wanna, I'm just going to run past the scene. Here's my th three speed points. Exactly. And so I'm playing with it. I've, obviously, there's some balanced stuff, but I feel like if you're interested in um, just saying that you know certain creatures are so powerful or certain people are so skilled that they can just bypass the need for roles for certain types of actions, then there's no reason we can't just spend points to do the things we want. Just use points essentially as story tokens, right? To just say, I get to do this cool thing. That's what this character gets to do. And that's, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, oh, yeah, so go ahead, Jim. Uh, Mark, Mark, Mark Massengal just followed up. I guess insight just spells out what I felt was the intent of these actions anyway. And, and you know, Mark, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 that's what it seems like, but... I Maybe mean, it's my misunderstanding of when I first hear it. When I first see this kind of stuff, like it's tough for me sometimes. Sometimes the old school gamer gym appears, and it's like he wants the players to, like, to to stop rolling dice sometimes and to just ask the questions. And uh, this is definitely a great way to get players to to do that to stop rolling the dice. But I, I, as long as it's not means they don't ask, they don't ask questions either anymore. It's just well, I can't figure it out. Insight, it, it, insight. It shouldn't be it shouldn't be a replacement for asking questions, but it should be a replacement, like I said, for asking the questions you don't know to ask. Gotcha. You know what I mean? I, I, I really can't. It's hard to explain that gap between care, you know, player knowledge and character knowledge. But that's what this does. Is this is essentially covering your butt. Because your character knows more than you do about their given area of expertise, unless you happen to be playing yourself. You That'd know, be so if, boring. If you're playing one of those, if you're, you know, if you're playing the uh, the overweight engineer who play or who role plays, uh, then you know, great, I know exactly <laughs> what I know because that's me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Let's move on to the next item here. Because I think, I, I won't go into the, is this applicable to Numenera or the Strange? Obviously, this is something that's a core mechanic that could work in any Cyber System game. Um, but it's still fairly optional, I think. Yeah. Right? Uh, I mean, that's another element of this. Is it's, This is really taking things in a more narrative direction. Well, I think everything's optional. I doubt I'll use this. But that's just because I, it's one more rule to keep in my head, and I have trouble keeping <laughs> And 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 it does definitely fit better in certain kinds of games than others. I mean, if you were running a caper game, you know, if you were running a game in Shadowrun or a game in like the Leverage universe or something like that, this is the kind of rule that really benefits that game more so than uh, you know dungeon crawls or you know typical exploration-y type adventures. Gotcha. All right, well, let's let's jump over to the lands of horror. So one thing that uh, the Cyber System Rulebook has in its depths is uh, some some rules, some optional rules for playing games in modern settings, fantasy settings, horror settings, sci-fi, and superhero. And <laughs> let's talk modern and fantasy. Seem pretty much there's not much in there. I would say is is crazy. Uh, so the, the, even the sci-fi. Uh, setting has the starship rules. If you go back to when we discussed Star Wars, Ryan, Mark, and us, you can go into 
see the Starship rules and we thought about those. So let's talk about horror for a second. And there's a couple of things in here, Ryan. Uh, horror mode, madness. Uh, let's chat about those here. Yeah, let me get to the page real quick so it's easier. It's uh, page 262 is horror mode. Now, I know this just enough that I took horror mode uh, and uh, uh, just kind of... It was a, a, a Jordan uh, Quang uh, had 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 discussed maybe using that as an option for survival mode when, uh, in dark my dark sun hack that I did this week. So when I kind of riffed on that and came up with something similar, but I've never used the rules as written. Um, yeah, so I mean it's pretty simple. I think the main thing to know is well, so the core concept is that intrusions in within the horror mode, at the time when the GM says, this is horror mode time, so bad bad stuff time within this horror game, uh, GM intrusions, or, or uh, rolled intrusions, become more likely over time. And so essentially you've got a number that escalates over time, begins at one, and that number, if you roll equal to or less than it, that's what triggers a rolled intrusion, as opposed to simply rolling a one. It escalates differently depending on kind of what you're doing. So exploring a large area, it's just whenever you roll an intrusion, so obviously it's going to be a downward spiral. Exploring, it's every 10 minutes or when you roll. And in combat, it's every round, which is very fast. <laughs> on the other hand, I mean... <laughs> If you're fighting Cthulhu, though, it's it's appropriate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what? But I don't see a cap here. I mean, <laughs> does it just go to twenty? Uh, like at a certain yeah. point, you just get an intrusion every single action, yep. uh, every single roll, even. Um, I mean, that's it's kind of crazy. But I mean, in my experience, fights in Cyber System don't last more than five to ten rounds. Oh so, my god, that's a long fight. Yeah, in it's a long system. battle. Yeah, so you're not. It's not that high necessarily. But you got to know not to do that when you're not really in combat. It's got to be like, you know, the real thing. Um, but, so basically it's an escalating likelihood that intrusions are going to happen. And I think within the context of intrusions as plot complications, which I think is becoming more and more of an idea, you know, Monty wrote uh, uh, an article about how intrusions aren't necessarily just fumbles. Um, <coughs> Uh, including rolled intrusions, which I think we intuitively want to say, okay, well, you rolled a one, it's time for something bad to happen to you that makes you look like an idiot. Um, instead, say, you know, this is, like, for me, it's about raising the stakes. I like intrusions to mean, oh, well, now not only this, you know, this thing's about to happen, but if it does happen, this happens, or, oh, the timer's going to go faster now, or whatever. you got to, you know, really build tension with these things and make, pe make people really... You know, feel like things are getting worse and worse and worse just before they save the day. That's what intrusions are about for me. And horror mode, in some ways, really heightens that. Right? You're going to get tons of. In you're going to get at least one round, I would imagine. Um, yeah, I mean, it'll build dread. So many rolls. Um, I think the thing to remember is that half your rolls practically are defense rolls during combat. Um, so thinking about how that might play into it, if you're if you tie your intrusions to what causes them. Um, you know, it could be, you know, tentacles grabbing you and pulling you down or towards that creature or whatever, you know. you got to think in terms of what it means in the scenario itself. Um, but you're really going to get a lot of them out of defense roles. Um, and so it's, it's, that's it's tricky. worth noting that there is a section on using GM intrusions in horror mode that really kind of spells out that, like, if you're exploring a, a haunted swamp or a haunted house that not every GM intrusion needs to be something explicitly bad. It could just be indications of the bad thing that are that is coming eventually. So that you can, again, the, the idea here is that you're trying to build dread, you're trying to build tension, so that you can make that horror game that usually just doesn't feel very horror, horrifying, you can actually build that that player dread so that it's like, oh god, I have to roll a die, and there's a 35% chance I'm going to roll a fumble here. And and that fumble could just be, like, you hear the moaning of the undead that are coming for you, or it could be that something grabs your ankle. Yeah. yeah but you know, the issue I have with that, though, and I'm going to play a little devil's advocate here, is that 
don't you feel that that's, that by making it just an indication of something that kind of waters down the intrusion, it's already something that someone can spend an experience point to get rid of. And why would I want to spend an experience point getting rid of... I think if you're going to make it that... that uh, just like a notification that something could happen, then then you, 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 you're in a setting where you're going to say everyone should take every intrusion because it's not worth spending an XP to get rid of. I would be very disappointed to spend an XP to not hear, like, you know, the ghost of Old Man Withers' chains clanging down the hallway, you know? I kind of well, want to know that I'm spending it for something good. I think so there's think, an understanding yeah. that, that GM intrusions are going to be coming up so often that you really can't right. afford to just cancel every single one. Exactly, because the thing is, not doing it does increase the horror mode level. And then the other thing is... I would do it as a countdown if I'm going to make ones that don't physically do anything. I'd say there's going to be a certain number of intrusions. Once we hit that number, the bad thing happens. And whoever rolled it, that's the one who gets grabbed. So, <laughs> you know, all of you should collectively not want it to go up, and you definitely don't want, want to be the one who rolls the intrusion that it comes up on. Yeah. And, and, and regular GM intrusions where you, do, where you do give out experience aren't, like put off to the side while you're in horror mode. You can still, like, if you're exploring that haunted house, you can give a, a real, a quote-unquote real intrusion, give out some experience, and that horror that, that horror mode, you know, window of what the rolled intrusion is, is still going to increase because you still had an intrusion. So, again, yeah, it's, it's, all about, it's all about building up dread and, and, and the likelihood that bad things are going to happen increasing over time. So actually, a, a GM intrusion, as opposed to a rolled intrusion, doesn't increase the horror mode level. That is... Depending when it's rolled. Not how I read it, but... At least on the table. Be. But, um... In any case, I, you're going to be getting so many intrusions, I'm not sure I would do a, a GM intrusion unless I was doing a group one, uh, where you pay the group... XP instead of just individual. Um, yeah. I mean, it would depend on the situation, obviously. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about some of the other horror things. You've also got shock. So the, I, I really like the shock rules um, for horror. Basically, the way it works is... Wait, before, before you, let's just shut up for one second here. Oh, okay. question here. Uh, so, uh, Mark, uh, Cleveland, Mass, and Gal. We got another question, just one second. Uh, uh, Donato, uh, you'd asked where where is Mark writing? And if there's a Q and A app that you can, if you're watching the video, if you hit the, the left of your screen, there's a Q and A button you hit, and it'll pop up, and the questions will pop up on our screen. Uh, otherwise, uh, I think your questions kind of came to a little bit late. You had a question uh, or a comment about about I think, insights earlier, and kind of we're a little past there. Uh, but uh, but yeah, if you, you go to the Q and A app, you can click that and turn it on, and you can ask questions. That's where Mark and Andy have been asking questions uh, in the app, which is attached to the video. So Mark's saying, I'm with James on this. Look at that. I'm with James on this. So far, Mark is my favorite uh, poster here. Look at that. I hit my players with much harder with intrusions as well. Won't this lead to a metagame desire to want to soften the impact of intrusions that really should be tough? I, I See, I don't agree. I mean, so there was, a, there was a Google Plus co uh, conversation earlier this week about GM intrusions, and I made a comment offhandedly about how I will occasionally throw in a GM intrusion that's actually beneficial to the players. And people were, like, surprised and a little bit concerned about that because they're like, well, what if people don't want to, you know, if, if people see that you're starting to give them good intrusions, they're not going to want to spend experience to, to negate intrusions. And I'm like, A, I, I can't count on... I literally, I have too many fingers on one hand for the number of times that somebody has negated a GM intrusion on me by paying for it. Uh, and then B, it's not like I'm doing, you know, 50% of the time I'm doing a good GM intrusion or something like that. It's like I literally probably will throw in one good GM intrusion like every three sessions. You know, so it's just like, and usually it's like my players are down, are, are low on experience, and they need a kick in the pants, and the story plot needs a kick in the pants, and so I use that to advance the plot. I use that to give the the characters a little bit of uh, a little bit of more go go juice and a little bit of uh, of impetus to start moving the the story forward again. I think it's the same way here. You know, uh, 
if you roll that, you know, if, if they're exploring that haunted house that we've been using as the example, and, and somebody rolls up a, a two, which is a, you know, intrusion at that point, um, just because you don't have a zombie jump out of a closet and start gnawing on the guy doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad intrusion. I mean, the fact that they're exploring a haunted house and then they hear creaking floorboards on the floor above them or they hear the coal-fired furnace in the basement fire up while there's nobody in the basement. Like, that's what horror stories are about. It's it, the, the intent there is to freak the players out as much as it is to, quote-unquote, screw them over or whatnot. Like, GM intrusions shouldn't just be about, like, punishing your players because that's not what they are. They're not punishment points. They're, they're tweaks to the plot. They're unexpected circumstances but they're not necessarily supposed to be punishment. I'm okay with it. It's they're good, but so I, because I'm, I'm of the, I'm of the punishment variety. So I, that is where my, my dungeon crawl classics aspects start to come through. And I think that they should be negative, but negative with a good, with, with as long as it advances the story. So for instance, if someone, if I was going to do the creaking floorboards, I was going to say, I hold up, and, and in my games, I will hold up two cards to the screen or two of whatever items I have because that's just our tradition in our game. It used to be Jeremy Lamb would hold up two experience point cards, and now I just, I'll just i hold up a cup and a stapler, and that's the GMI. That's how we do it in our game. <laughs> that's great. Uh, you know, they'll say, I want the stapler. Uh, so <laughs> it's going to be, if, if there's a GMI in my game, something bad's going to happen. Now, it's not going to kill your character, but... If it was creaking floorboards, I would say your character's freaked out. We need to make some kind of fear roll or affect the madness thing. It's going to have a negative impact. It's not just going to be anxious going to be floorboards in my game. But that's, again, that's GM style, and now every GM rolls. So. That is definitely GM style. And, I mean, if you want to do if you want to do a fear check when, when that happens, well, that's what the shock thing is for, which we were about to talk about. So, hey, look at that. And it's, Wait, it's, I was just gonna say a follow people. up here. He says, "If uh, yeah, we just get into GM style." Mark, we agree. Mark, 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 we agree. <laughs> it's the GM style. Uh, if I need to go go do, I don't need an intrusion. Why well, just give them the creaking floorboard narration when they get bored? It should be bored. B O A R D. I'd be like, hey, you get it? <laughs> creaking floorboard. Never mind. No, I think we're the same. I think we're all in the same boat though. Here, it's like you know, it is. How your game is so so so. Yeah. How does shock work then, uh, okay. Ryan? Well, just real quick, my two cents on it, on the intrusion thing is. Oh, just, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, I think that how you handle intrusions is incredibly personal for every GM and their group, and so if this doesn't work for you, then don't use it because for some people it would, and for some people it wouldn't. I think that narration for me, the way I would handle it would be something bad happens. You just don't know everything about what is going on. Like, the the serpent underneath the house woke up. Well, all you heard was a little bit of some noise. That's the creepy noise you heard. The creepy noise happens to be something bad happening somewhere you don't know everything about. Because really, horror is all about how much, what you don't know yeah. and yeah. teasing it. It's, um, it. you got to build the tension. You have to earn that tension. And you yeah. can't just, like, you can't just throw, you know torture porn at the screen. Oh, wait, sorry. Now I'm getting into a different topic. Shock! Let's talk about shock! Yeah, and, and Mark, those are great questions, though, too, so keep them, keep them coming, you know? Yeah. Um, so the way shock works, it's very simple. It's just like, does your character get stunned for the round or, or run away for a round? Basically lose their action for a round. And, you know, this can happen any, any time in a horror scenario where something kind of scary happens. It's got a table on 262 for things that could do it. So, like, a, a jump scare is only difficulty one, whereas, like, uh, watching someone die is difficulty three. Um, seeing something impossible is four. So these are intellect rolls against that difficulty. If you fail, um, you're stunned, or whatever. You're, 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 you're in shock. So you could just scream, or you could run away. Um, it, it, it does mention GMs should be working with the player to figure out what thing they do. Um... Yeah, I'm surprised it doesn't say you wet yourself anywhere. Um, but <laughs> this is a, a family book, I guess. Uh, Did but, it say so, that before? Was that in there? Like, was that in like the the horror, the madness one? What was it called? There was the there was the madness one. Strange era. Strange Strange era. Strange era. Is there wetting yourself in there? No, I don't. Probably think. not. 
I don't remember. Uh, Darn. They, they tend to be relatively clean with that kind of stuff on there. Um, but the, my favorite part, though, is that when you see a monstrous creature, the difficulty is just the level of the creature. It's just so elegant. It's like, oh, I've got a scary monster. Anytime you have a scary monster, it just has the ability to potentially shock people. Yep. And they just roll against the difficulty. Yep. What an ele- I mean, it's such... And if, and if said, you know, if, if the monstrous creature is jumping out of the... You know, if they go to open a closet and the monstrous creature jumps out of the closet, you could, you know, add an, a, a level or yeah, two because it's, a, it's also a jump scare, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. It's such a simple, elegant system. And it's just, you know, a little bit of stunning. It's not like it's every round. It's just when the thing happens that's kind of scary, you potentially go into shock. So if I want to do a Cypher system version of Five Nights at Freddy's, just really, really <laughs> use the shock level here and the jump scare thing. I don't well, know. What that know is. I, I don't know. Shock Have you guys ever been on. shocked in real life? Uh, what was that? Have you ever been shocked by something in real life, like where you couldn't act? Because I, uh, I used to work in Hollywood and I, no. I worked in a movie theater <laughs> in the Valley, in the San Francisco Valley, and I, I would have movie stars come in all the time, and I would get starstruck where I couldn't uh, do anything. And I was supposed to like tell them where the movie, you know, the auditorium was, and I couldn't do it. So I, I can, I know exactly what this is saying. Where you, you know, you just, you can't. You know. I get chased by dogs pretty frequently as a runner. You know, I mean, I go running and I, and dogs will come after me. I, I just have instinctively do the wrong thing, which is run away. Well, I used to do that. Now I, <laughs> I've stopped doing that after getting chased down by one. Not scary enough to shock. Yeah. You. I don't know. It was a German <laughs> Shepherd once. It was pretty scary. Okay. Right. So, and then the the final thing is madness. madness. So these rules, I believe, are the same as the oh, ones strange and. Sorry. Yeah, uh, these are in strange eons as well. Um, for me, th- this has been, this is the part that I think is a little bit. Uh, I don't know. It, it's not my favorite mechanic because it's, it's essentially much. just. It's totally crunchy, sort of, uh, the way the, the framework of it at least. Obviously, you can you're going to want to handle. Madness. Madness is a touchy subject because we're talking about mental illness, right? Yeah. This is really sort of how to handle it in a very gamery way, um, and perhaps in a horror way. Because obviously, in a Cthulhu type setting, for instance, you're looking for, you know, madness as sort of it's like sanity. You're looking at the old sanity loss I- yeah. idea. This isn't yeah. this isn't like oh well, let's let's simulate. Um, you know, depression in a realistic way. This is, let's simulate going out of your mind and, and yeah. becoming a monster yourself because you learned the dark secrets that no one was supposed to know. I, I did, I played Wraith the Oblivion once. That was pretty much depression in a real way. Yeah, that was a well-written game to was simulate and impose depression on It was you. a fantastically well-written game. For that specific, for just yes. bumming you out. Oh, it was really depressing. You know, the cover of that book glows in the dark, the word Wraith, and it scared me <laughs> so bad as a teenager when I first learned that in the middle of the night uh, in a dark room. <laughs> um, anyway, so back to madness. So the way it works is scary stuff causes you to take intellect damage. When you get reduced down to zero intellect in your temporary pool, uh, you basically lose a permanent point of intellect. Um, once you get down to zero permanent intellect, you're you know totally gone. Buffs. you're gone. Um, and so by inflicting mental damage, because that's one of the options, you know, with shock you could instead be taking intellect damage equal to usually to the level of the scare. Um, you know, so let's say you see Greater Cthulhu and it's a level 10 creature. You could potentially be taking 10 intellect damage. If you've only got 8 intellect, you, uh, you know, lose a permanent. And you could potentially go permanently insane. Um, huh. It's a pretty simple system. And I guess it covers the bases in terms of characters losing their mind, literally. Um, and, and it, you know, it talks about the nuances of being a character that has some decent intellect edge um, dealing with that. I think for me, if I had intellect edge, that means that I'm an intellect character probably, and losing permanent intellect from learning things, which is probably what an intellect character is into, I, I think I'd be pretty mad about it. Um, I haven't really worked with these rules. I, I personally, this isn't this isn't a system for me. I'd rather you know use a deranged yeah, table out of Vampire the Masquerade. 
I don't have a whole lot to add. I think this is a little bit too complicated for its own good, just to simulate, you know, um, something that really should be a role play trait, in my opinion. But um, you know, maybe it'll work for some people. Uh, you know, I imagine that as the aforementioned, if you if you're running Call of Cthulhu Cipher System style, then you know, maybe it maybe that fits really well and it makes sense to use it in that way. But uh, I think the more elegant way of using it, you know, at least in my tables, is been anything that's horror based is that player characters can take intellect damage and just bypass the might and and the, the yeah. speed and go right to intellect. It's this, oh, wow. actually the same thing. That's and a cool way. Yeah, I mean it, it's simple and it, it it's not long term. And if you want to say the player wants to say, look, I've been taking intellect damage over and over and over again. I'm going to see my character is now mad or doomed or he's changed his 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 persona now or craven or something. I think that's cool. Yeah. Um, I think that, but you, you you already damage intellect. You can have monsters that they're designed to damage intellect, whether it's because they're psionic or because just they're so terrifying, and it's. It sort of. I mean, I've I've always felt, even before in Strange Eons and before this, that intellect pool kind of gave you that ability to do that without going to the full charts and graphs level. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I th I think I think that's a more elegant solution, at least for the way that I would GM a game. Um, you know, again, it, it, there may be people out there who want that crunchier experience rules wise, and if so, it's there. You know, to me, it really reminds me of the call of. Call of Cthulhu rules for sanity. It's basically the same thing. It's just that it has more implications here in terms of your actual doing intellect roles. Which I think is good. I mean, in a sense, like if you think of intellect as not just intellectual things, but also social roles, as you go insane, you're going to have a harder time interacting with people. I guess that's appropriate. But in general, it's a little bit heavy handed for me. Uh, uh... I'm gonna butcher your name, dude. So Donato Di Nicolo Di Beto Bardi. Man, that is a long name. Uh, not a question. I play a far realm from D and D or Umbra Dreaming World of Darkness style campaign where not characters but a world around them goes mad based on where characters are. And that kind of reminds me of Deadlands had a fear level system. And I think you could totally do something like that and maybe just say that's you know that's the that's the level. So you entering an area uh, where there's just a static fear that you know maybe you enter a, so so many times in the evening you make player characters make a difficulty uh, you know a level three difficulty uh, check uh, for you know intellect defense to just stave that off. And if they if they fail, they take you know some ambient damage or something like that. But you can ratchet it up. Or maybe that, or or you can have it that adds on as a you kind of tack that on to monsters. So a a creature, a level two creature that usually would be at the difficulty two for this whole shock thing. Uh, there would be if there's a ambient two horror level around you. Now it's a, like a difficulty four to not get that. So yeah. I think the idea of having the world go mad is great because you that's easy to track. And and I like I, I think that you could take that further and if, if you were in a if you were in a a dead land that was like you know horror level four or whatnot use horror mode for that area increase the GM intrusion range yeah. by four points exactly and exactly. so uh, when you're in that dead land that's a level four dead land all GM intrusions are rolled on a one through five now and if that's a fixed number it doesn't change dynamically but if the entire time that you're in that dead land you're going to be rolling 25% of the time, you're going to be getting a and, GM intrusion. And give it a particular flavor for those intrusions while you're there. Exactly. So to move us along here, just because uh, we're, uh, I want to make sure you get the last one here, but uh, just real quick, on, on horror, I think we already know it's adaptable to Numenera or The Strange. Again, I, I, uh, any other systems or universes you can see adapting it to? Well, I mean, I think like you were saying at the outset, um, where you took the horror mechanic and you adapted it into a um, survival mechanic to represent how harsh the, the wastelands of, of Athos are, I think that's a great way to look at horror mode as not necessarily horror mode, but like a difficulty mode or a, you know, a challenge mode. Same thing with the Deadland idea, Same, you know. Um, I, I had actually, uh, in an upcoming, the, the next issue of the Cyphercaster, I wrote a big 
big article about how to um, make the the cipher limit feel a little bit more uh, uh, organic to the setting that you're in. And I suggested for horror games, if you go over your cipher limit, instead of having ciphers disappear or having like a weird table of random stuff that happens, every cipher that you're over your limit increases the horror mode for your character. You're carrying around bad mojo, and it is increasing the potential for weird and bad stuff to happen to your character. That's fantastic. You know? and that, it, Go ahead. That, that is similar to what I did with, with, with Dark... So with the, the Darkson mechanic was that traveling... Because in Darkson and Athos, traveling in the wilderness is dangerous, and crazy things can happen. And traveling in the wilderness has a, just an automatic base five essentially horror mode, survival mode, and you mitigate it by one step based on traveling on a main road, having a guide or someone trained or specialized in in, in wilderness travel, uh, traveling with a caravan, or traveling... There's one more I had on there. So you can just descend it that way. Uh, and then and the, if it's a the, bad area, you can raise it up as well. Sure. Yeah. And, and the, the one more thing here uh, Donato pointed out was using intrusions to make NPCs erratic, paranoid, nonsensical. I'm, I'm guessing you mean that for, for a horror setting or... You know whether you're it's in horror mode or the madness level. Yeah, you can you can start if you're using that madness level for the world around you. Uh, mm -hmm. You could certainly have it affect the NPC, especially in my mind if it affects the the, the PC in a negative way. That looks yeah. great. I just had an idea for how to handle madness. What if you know because in a lot of these settings we're using subtle ciphers primarily instead of manifest ciphers when you're talking about horror. Why not make it so that when you're learning too much you automatically take on too many ciphers. You know what I'm saying? And, and make it so that the repercussion for too many ciphers, subtle ciphers, is madness. Right? Interesting. I, guess, I, I don't know. You have to figure out a mechanic for what the implications are, but the yeah. idea is it's too much knowledge. And so you get a benefit and a, a drawback to it. Which kind opening, of opening the books. Yeah. Yeah, whether whether that's increasing the rolled, the rolled GMI... Uh, cascade or something that, else. That yeah, that fun. could work. Is yeah, too much knowledge puts you higher up. The, exactly. The mode. Right, well, let's jump over to the last one here. We're going to cover, which is and the one I know the absolute least about. Because I've never read anything about power shifts. I have no idea how power shifts work. I just know they're <laughs> there. Mark, what the heck is a power shift, and why? How does it affect my games? All right. So power shifts are basically how the cipher system gets from characters who are pretty capable to characters who are super capable. I mean, that's literally what this is. is this is the mechanic that is, enables you to, to go from a regular Cypher System character who's fairly capable to being super powered, super capable. And your GM, at the start of the game, like when you're making characters, your GM is going to tell you how many shifts that you get. And it, the standard number is five. He could give you a little bit fewer if you wanted to run a lower power, like a, maybe a pulpy type campaign. He could give you more if you wanted to run something crazy cosmic where you're going to be blowing up planets. Um, but you buy different shifts, and there's different categories. There's a category for accuracy, dexterity, healing, intelligence, power, resilience, singles, uh, single attacks, and then strength. And Essentially, what a shift does is it is a permanent and free level of effort to the activity of that scope. So if you, for instance, take accuracy, accuracy affects all attack rolls. If you have a power shift, in, if you take two power shifts in accuracy, every attack that you make is two steps easier, always, without cost, period. End of discussion. And that could be effort for damage too. You could convert that to three plus. Damage. No, that's 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 power. That's a different. Uh, uh, that's yeah. a different. So there's then there's power, which is a specific power including damage, but does not affect attack rolls. So those are those are offset against each other because otherwise it's it's broken. Um, or you can take the single attack, which is attack rolls and damage for a single specific type of attack. So if you wanted to make a. a, a a Wolverine character, you take two ranks of single attack and you have his claws. They they hit really easy because they're adamantium and they cut through everything, and they do a lot more damage because they're adamantium and they cut through everything. Um, and the, the shifts are basically... They allow that, that character to be tweaked to be super. You know, if you're playing a strong warrior who uh, grows to enormous size, like, you're already a pretty capable you know, strong character, but you're not super strong yet. You take uh, 
three shifts worth of strength, and all of a sudden, all of your your lifting, jumping, dealing damage, throwing things, everything but attack rolls with regards to strength is three steps easier always at every time with no cost to you. And I it's mean, always on. It's always on. Right, I played so a speed I played a game of uh, of Super Cipher System last year at Gen Con, and I had a speedster, and I had uh, I think two points or three points in um, my movement, and I had a couple of points in basically attacking with my fists. And so, anytime I needed to 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 move, whether that was a a speed defense or just running between uh, you know locations or whatnot, it was three steps easier. And every time I was punching something super fast with my fists, it was two steps easier and I was doing a certain amount of extra damage because, not because I was super strong, but because I was landing like 600 blows for every one that the enemy was getting. And it works. It, my character felt like a speedster. Like, w w the, one of the other guys at the table was super strong and he had, he did all... I, I want to say he was do dealing a minimum of 10 damage with every punch. And he literally punched a guy into essentially a fine red mist, you know, by accident. And my character being the speedster, I was also playing a little bit kooky, and so I was able to run into the room with a mop and bucket and clean up the mess instantaneously and then run back to where I was. And the GM was like, all right, that's going to be like a level three task. I'm like, all right, well, I don't have to roll then. And I just did it because I was super fast, and that's how it worked. And it was great. It it really makes the characters feel powerful. So so like uh, so use a real world example. Just so now that there's any, all right. So if if I have a character with a level with five five power shifts in intellect defense rolls, like yep. super strong mind and. We'll just say it's Liam Neeson in the movie Taken because he's like <laughs> he is his superhero. Okay. He faces off against Cthulhu. Yeah. Who is a level ten creature, and Cthulhu's madness affecting Liam Neeson's character in Taken. Already, the difficulty goes from a ten to a five because he has five power shifts. That is correct. Before even making any before doing before doing anything, anything. at all. And then I if he was blending the genres there, that's perfect. That, yeah, dude, that's how I roll, dude. That's like my brain. I'm already right. figuring. If I was like, if I was in a superhero game, I would play his character from and from Take. Fighting the and if he had specialization and in intellect <laughs> yeah. defense, that would go from a five to a three. And then if he had, if he decided to put a level of effort to it, it would go from a three to a two. And Cthulhu would essentially be like, you know, that scary dog down the street. <laughs> That's how Liam Neeson would look at Cthulhu. He'd be like, come on, seriously? I have a certain set of skills. <laughs> but it's important to know you're not really supposed to put more than, like, what, three into a I think they recommend no more than three, but, I mean, again, that's a recommendation. I mean, just like, just like a, the recommendation is to start with five shifts. I mean, right. if I was playing a, like... World War Two with superheroes, like like legit superheroes, I would probably say that players start off with like two shifts, and then every time they gain a tier, I would give them another shift, so that by the end of the war, when they're like tier five, they're running around, they're like lifting up tanks and like you know punching Hitler into orbit and stuff. But when it starts off, they're still going to be like, all right, well that's a machine gun nest. This is going to actually hurt a little bit. Yeah. Donato says Liam Neeson has five power shifts in very particular set of skills. Yeah. <laughs> That's, what we're about. That's a new focus. That's intelligent. I, I am a tough glaive who has a very particular set of skills. There you go. <laughs> so power shifts ends up being a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I, I, and, and, and the thing about power shifts is, I mean, you did it without even thinking about it, and you genre mashed it. And if I wanted to play... Um, Starship Troopers or Warhammer 40k where I had guys running around in power armor, I would just use power shifts. I would give everybody a couple of points of resilience which gives them free armor. I might give them a, you know, a point of strength to give them the strength of that power armor. It would be like a, I would build a template of what that armor is out of power shifts. You could even do this in The Strange. You could right? do that in The Strange. So for certain exactly. recursions, you're getting some of these for free, you know, I yep. mean, imagine a recursion that's just, you know, there could be a supers one, but you could do other ones where, I you know, gravity's low or whatever, where you get a little bit of these here and there. 
Yep. It makes perfect sense. It's really kind of a cool system. I mean, if you were doing a if you were doing a Japanese Ultraman style recursion, and one of the characters, you know, put on the Ultraman uh, doohickey and turned it Ultraman, it's like, all right, here's what your shifts are that make you <laughs> Ultraman, and then you also gain the ability to shoot a laser out of your head fin thing, and and you know whatever, <laughs> and and. It doesn't have to just be for superpowers. You can you can do it for a science fiction game. You can right. do it for a monster game. You can yeah. you can do it. And the thing is, and and we, we I haven't mentioned it, but NPCs can take power shifts. So if you have, you know, Doctor Destructo, you can give him three power shifts in his Destructo beam, so that his Destructo beam is like capable of leveling a building. And it does the same thing for them that it does for the for the PCs. It adds that damage. It makes it that much. It increases the level to resist those attacks. Cool. So it, again, it's it's a it's a really smart, simple. Well, maybe not quite simple, but elegant system. It's pretty elegant. I I don't know. There's not a lot on this. Yeah, the only I'd say is it's a little limited. Like I my my fa- I'm not a big supers gamer. Um, my my favorite. Uh, System that handles uh, superhero stuff is, is is Savage Worlds just because it's the one that I tend to play the most and oh yeah I can bolt them on really easily but it's a whole book worth of them so it, it's very particular powers like if I wanted to create someone who could like mimic other people's activities or could steal you their powers focus for that yeah like, you, 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 you have to infiltrate yeah it's not so you know, it's not like so easy with this you have to kind yeah. of play with that if you're building a superhero character you have to look into everything about that character from type to focus to yeah the, the shifts yeah. the shifts are just Absolutely. a tool to bring the guy from capable to super capable mm-hmm. the 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 actual power you know the 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 I'm Superman, so I'm I'm strong and tough, and I can fly and shoot laser beams out of my eyes. Like that comes from your type and focus abilities, maybe even your descriptor, as much as it does from what you choose to put your power shifts to. You know, if you're making, um, you know, Iron Man, and you've got armor and flight and r- repulsor beams, then you've got to make sure that you choose an appropriate focus. So either the uh, wears the the you know powered armor suit or whatever it's called, or maybe stains like a bastion, which is another one that's armor focused, and then you've got to choose your type abilities accordingly as well, and you've got to mix and match those. But you um, can do it. It's pretty easy. You can totally do it, and it's I, I I kind of I realized, and I wrote a blog post about this I think two weeks ago about how you can do the same thing with races in fantasy games, like. You could have a descriptor for Hobbit or dwarf or elf, or you could say, you know what? All right, all all Hobbits are, you know, uh, uh, jovial and they throw pretty well, and you know they have a, a pretty decent constitution. And then you could pick and choose the abilities that fit to build that character from within your options and everything else and still be able to take whatever focus and whatever descriptor you want. Right. You don't have to feel like, you're, oh, I'm a halfling and I'm the stereotypical halfling because that's what all, all halflings are. You know, you can still be a, uh, I don't know, um, a, a, a craven hobbit <laughs> who is a... Oh, no. uh, who is a speaker because he he likes to tell stories? Who happens to throw with deadly accuracy because you like that aspect of the character? And it's like all of a sudden you've got like this cowardly little bastard who can really whip stuff at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, any uh, any right, about ten fifteen here? Any final points on any of this stuff we want to toss out there? So I mean, Mark, I mean, uh, Ryan, is there anywhere you would use power shifts somewhere that's other than Numenera the Strange? I know Mark used to well, start some troopers and yeah, I think tech is a great idea in terms of tying it to certain tech. But again, you know, I've been talking about a, a vampire setting. You know, why not do that if you're playing supernatural creatures that are superhuman in some way? Yep. Give them these things or give them choices within these things. Um, that's an easy way to handle it as well. Or let people get access to these when they roll a major effect. Um, you know, get it for the, uh, the next ten minutes or something. Um, you could even build these into ciphers, where you know you get access to these through a cipher use for a yeah, while. for ten minutes. All kinds of fun things. 
Um, you know, one of the things that you mentioned in the write-up for tonight's episode um, was subtle ciphers. Oh, I did I? Um, that I had, you know, we've talked before about, you know, subtle ciphers, there's not quite as many as maybe I would like in the book. Um, I think there's 28 uh, in the base table. But I found there's actually an additional set of five of them on page 347 that are for when you're only using subtle ciphers. And they're really good. I really like them. So they're worth looking at. It's closer, yeah. It's closer to, like, maneuvers. I really think subtle ciphers are something that could be expanded more and more. I think they could represent social things and plot changes and, uh, you know, gambits and just all kinds of fun things. Uh, I, I had mentioned using them in my Dark Sun uh, conversion as, if, as an alternate way of... of, of uh, there's there's a there's a in Dark Sun uh, in the thir- in the second edition Dark Sun game every character had a wild talent which is a psionic right. ability that was like a just a latent ability that they all had and although it doesn't it, it doesn't quite fit the canon rules that every character at any time and, and if you didn't want to use I, I first in the mutation table you could give you kind of the same effect if you didn't want to use that you could just say that every character has one slot always filled of a subtle cipher. That's always there, just their manifestation of their psionic ability just kind of bubbling to the surface. Yeah. Mm. And that refills every day. Mm. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's, you know, um that definitely an option. Um I'm trying to remember who it was. I think it was Michael Berry on the uh the Cypher G plus communities. Had uh he was talking about how he had started dealing out the cipher cards from the DAC and instead of assigning the cipher, a specific cipher from the card, he left it open to the players to pick which one on the card they were going to use when they used that card. Oh, and then also he allowed them to describe how that particular cipher was going to manifest within the game. So if you were playing in a modern setting and you had an explosion cipher, you know maybe you describe it as grabbing like uh, a fire extinguisher and some chemicals and whipping up an improvised bomb and that becomes the cipher. And I really liked that idea in that it was it was subtle, uh, you know, it was a subtle cipher in that you weren't carrying around a bomb, but it was allowing you to use the full range of ciphers for the most part as though they were subtle. And it was really and it and also it does put that onus on the player to be able to come up with how did you make this thing happen? You know, I mean, some of the ciphers are pretty wild. Like, if you come up with, like, an anti-gravity cipher and you want to use it, you've got to, like, describe how your character builds something that acts the same way that anti-gravity cipher does. Mm. Um, and you get, yeah, I think you're going to see MacGyvery type results with that, which is cool, though. You know, it's like, I'm going to build a uh, hot air balloon out of uh, mylar and duct tape, and uh, I'm going to use that to uh, relieve some of the weight on this chest so that I can carry it out of the building. It's like, all right. <laughs> So I, I think that's yeah, another thing that where the like just because these not all of the ciphers are subtle doesn't mean they can't be played as though they were subtle. I guess right. I think especially in a game where you're looking for <clears throat> like cobbling things together, like you're saying MacGyvering things up. I think in other in some settings that's not perfect, um, and so manifest ciphers are less useful um, than subtle ciphers. So that's where I wish we had a little bit more in terms of the number of subtle ciphers out there. Yeah, um, but I honestly, think that the games that where the I, the games that you can't use regular ciphers are, I think, fewer than the ones where you may want to use subtle and manifest. They may be fewer, but it's not. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think they still exist, and why not? Hmm. not oh, I understand. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna wrap us up here. It's uh, about ten twenty. Uh, just want to first off thank uh, everyone who sent some questions. So Andrew. Uh, Mark, Donato, thank you so much for tossing some questions and comments in. We didn't get to all of them, so uh, I do apologize, but we covered a bunch of them. Uh, one thing I like to point out, uh, we always say this, and we haven't quite gotten any feedback on this yet, but if anyone would like to toss us an idea for the next show, usually what happens is about two weeks from now, either Mark or Ryan or the three of us will get together on G Plus and say, are we going to pull this off soon? And when? You know, and we, we think about, oh, what that's going to be, you know? And once we figure it out, uh, 
we say, well, what are we going to talk about? You know, and the last time we got off easy because we had we had to cover this stuff still. But next time we don't know. So uh, if someone has an idea for a show topic, I think uh, we'd be open to hear it and open to having more Q and A and all that. So and uh, and if there's if there's questions we didn't answer, like put them in the event on Google Plus, and we'll try to answer them later. Yeah. That way. You know, I mean, just because we're just because we're wrapping the show for the evening doesn't mean we can't continue to answer questions. Absolutely. Or hear comments. I mean. Yep. You know, it's harder to address comments. Especially comments where it comes down to how I was right on something. <laughs> oh, <important>. boy. <laughs> anyway. Uh, no. So, yeah. So, thank you so much, guys, for coming on. And uh, please, uh, you know, definitely, if you, if you enjoyed this, like, comment, and subscribe below if you're watching us on YouTube. And we'll be thinking up ideas for the next time. So, yep. all right, everyone. Thanks, and have a good night. Peace good night. out. Back the Kickstarter. Thank <laughs> you.